Today we welcome Dr. Stephen Moshier, who is a professor of geology and chair of the Geology Environmental Science Department at Wheaton College, where he also serves as the director of the Black Hills Science Station. Besides his work in academia, he also has practiced geology as an oil company explorationist, with much of his early research describing and interpreting oil reservoir rocks. Most recently, his research efforts are in the field of geoarchaeology, participating in expeditions to the Sinai coast, Egypt, and Israel. Moshir has served as past president of the Geological Society of Kentucky and the affiliation of Christian geologists. Currently, he serves on the executive council of the American Scientific Affiliation. Welcome, Dr. Moshir. I mean, tell us more about your background and both, both like your academic background and um, maybe about your spiritual upbringing or your, your background. Um, yeah, sure. Um, well, I was lured into science in the uh, age of uh, manned exploration, you know, moon, Apollo. Uh, I just, uh, in kindergarten is when Alan Shepard went up into space and, and I remember it was broadcast over the loudspeaker in the classroom and I, I was just hooked. I um, just dreamed about being an astronaut someday. I, I think by the time I was in high school, I thought I realized I probably wasn't cut out to be a pilot, but they were beginning to send scientists into space. And I discovered geology through, you know, watching all of the, the moonwalks. And so I always say Walter Cronkite was my first geology professor. And then um, uh, went off uh, to Philmont Scout Ranch in New Mexico. And one of the scout masters was my father and the other scout master had been my earth science teacher in middle school. And I hadn't thought much about earth science when I took it in middle school, but I, he just answered every question that I had. And there's so many, there's wonderful geology there in, in New Mexico. So I applied to college to be a geology major. Uh, and I went off to Virginia Tech uh, wanting to study moon rocks. And then they stopped going to the moon. And I got more interested in, in the geology of Earth. Uh, but I still have a love for planetary geology. Now, my spiritual journey is really connected to my academic uh, journey. In my senior year of high school, uh, my father contracted a, a pretty aggressive uh, form of cancer. And I watched the community around uh, my father and my mother in my neighborhood, in our church, in the, in the, in the whole town. I grew up in a, a small town in, in upstate New York. And uh, there was just a lot of prayer for my father. And it was a spirituality that I'd never experienced or seen. And my family hadn't really experienced or seen. So that was really interesting to me and, 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 and um, was something that, 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 you know, was just kind of new. Um, my father did pass away before my graduation. So you can imagine I went off to college with a lot of questions about that. And it, and it seemed like, you know, God was waiting for me there in Blacksburg, Virginia, because just about everybody I met the first week or so in my dorm or um, even in the geology department were, were Christians. And um, so that was, that was really, you know, a, a special thing to have, you know, such great friends in the faith. And then I discovered that one of my professors, well, actually a couple of my professors were believers and one in particular, Dr. Paul Ribby, who is a very distinguished mineralogist, um, really became kind of a, you know, well, he was both a spiritual mentor and, a, and an academic mentor to me. So uh, then going on from that, graduate school, being involved in um, various kinds of campus fellowships, met my wife at a church in, in Houston. And so our spiritual journey has been together since then. Um, really interesting. So, so as you're doing this academic journey, you're having a spiritual journey too. How did the science and faith interaction look to you growing during this time? Well, growing up, there was no 
you know, that, that just wasn't a concern. And in my church, we never talked about, in fact, we talk about science sometimes in, in my church, you know, God created everything and, and, but there was never any uh, promotion of a literal interpretation of Genesis. Uh, I wasn't even aware of that until a neighbor, one of the neighbors who was, you know, praying for my father um, when I was, I guess, a sophomore, maybe I was a sophomore in college. She gave me a book by Henry Morris called The Remarkable Birth of the Planet Earth. And that was my first exposure to young earth creationism. And by that time I'd had enough geology that I, I really felt like I could evaluate the claims that, that you know, Dr. Morris was making in the book. And I just, I couldn't make sense of it. It, 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 it just seemed very wrong to me. And I, I went to my professor Ribby about that. And, and he assured me that, you know, there are people in the church that have that point of view. He even knew Dr. Morris because Dr. Morris had taught at Virginia Tech uh, earlier in his career. And, and he assured me that, that this was not one of those things with, that was a salvation issue and that um, I should be free to uh, pursue science and, and, and not um, worry about a, a conflict uh, with the faith because there were uh, different ways that people would um, look at the accounts of origins in scriptures and, and the accounts of origins from science. But you've become more actively involved in this discussion. I mean, you've written a couple books and um, like I have this beautiful book and where you were a contributor here. It's just a lovely, oh, thank lovely you. book. Um, I give it to lots of people for Christmas and birthdays. And um, Oh yeah, thank you. That's great. I and, appreciate that. Yeah, and you're, you have a really two almost um, understanding scientific theories of origins. I mean, that's like, it's like mm -hmm. nine, 900 pages long. Yeah, I got Something it right like here. Ah, here it is. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I only wrote a little tiny part of it, so I didn't write the whole, the whole um, thing. So how did how did that this change? How did you get involved in in this well, conversation? And yeah, I think that I I I really was taken by the the tension that was that was in the church and between Christians and non Christians on this. Uh, I actually saw Henry Morris uh, debate my paleontology professor at, at Virginia Tech. And I was just so uh, conflicted, not that I agreed with, with Dr. Morris, but that my, you know, Christian friends felt like, oh, Dr. Morris just did such a great job. And then my, my, my geology friends were, oh, Dr. Bombach's doing such a great job. And it just... It, it was just such an uncomfortable experience for me to have friends in both of those um, communities. And, and then I, I discovered organizations like the American Scientific Affiliation. I discovered uh, even the writings of Francis Schaeffer, um, a, a freedom to explore science and understand Genesis in a way that wasn't literal. So those were the kinds of things that, that um, helped me, but also I, I, I guess I really longed to be part of the dialogue as, as well. And so that's kind of what, what, what I, you know, I had no idea I would end up at, at Wheaton College uh, where I would be in a place where I could, you know, really um, learn from theologians and, and have colleagues who would want to work with me on, on projects like this. So it, I just kind of look back and see everything kind of in, kind of falling in place. But I really did early on long to be part of the part of the dialogue in some way. How surprised are you that the arguments of Henry Morris have persisted? Um, and I don't know that um, young Earth creation has waned at all. It might have even picked up steam with the popularity of uh, answers in Genesis and homeschool mm -hmm. movements and with school yeah. groups and church groups uh, taking buses to the Ark Encounter. Did this surprise you? Does, does this surprise you at all? I guess I have to say not. Um, I, in the 25 years I've been at Wheaton, I've kind of seen an up and down of, of interest. And so you're right. I think there's been a resurgence of interest with the platform uh, of of uh, answers in Genesis, Ken Ham's group, um, 
and I, I guess, uh, but I've also seen, you know, uh, 15 years ago, there, there were no books that kind of gave Christians an, an alternative view other than uh, young earth creationism. I think Hugh Ross probably was the first to introduce some books where, um, you know, he was presenting, you know, alternative uh, views. Uh, and so over time, uh, BioLogos, uh, American Scientific Affiliation, other, other organizations have, um, have provided resources for people. So I think um, one of the things I've noticed is that students who come to where I teach um, that have had a young earth creationism background um, really begin to appreciate that it's it's a, there's a lot to this issue. It's not something that can be settled in a you know a Saturday afternoon seminar at church. That uh, there's a lot of study that needs to be involved, and it's just as much a study of of the Bible and theology as it is a study of of science. And so my experience is that that students um, respect both positions, uh, but but they don't denigrate one over the other. Uh, they realize that there's more to it than what they thought there was, and that they have a lot to learn. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I, I am uh, encouraged when students get the opportunity to um, to learn more about the issues. I'm sure, as a professor, though at, at Wheaton, you've probably had a multitude of kids come through that have only been exposed to young earth creation. That's and right. And they arrive in your classroom. And it must be a culture shock. Um, sure. I was at a museum in South Dakota. The um, South Dakota School of Mines has a wonderful geology museum in Rapid City. And we teach science courses in the Black Hills every summer. And I've been out there many summers in the, in the past 25 years. Um, we teach both general education and uh, field science for geology majors. Um, we were at the, the museum there at at School of Mines and their dinosaurs and all kinds of ancient mammals. And, and one of the students came up to me and she said, this is all a joke, right? I, I, yeah, what? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I was just told that this is all a hoax. Uh, explain, you know, I, 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 explain this to me. And, and that, was, that was amazing. Now that hasn't been very common. Uh, some students will tell me that they heard that, but they didn't necessarily believe that, but they knew that, that people they knew believed that. So, you know, it's, it is there. It, it is there. Um, so maybe I'm spoiled. I, I've, I've, I work with wonderful students. And like I said, even if they stick to a young earth um, view, um, by the time they've had, you know, Old Testament and New Testament and theology and science courses, um, they, they realize that the issue is much more complex than they ever knew and that they, they needed to respect the the opposing side as, as having some validity, whether or not they accept it. That would be an ideal goal. But how oftentimes, as a, Christine and I have seen faith shipwrecked on, on the shoals of sure. earth creation. and That's right. Um, and they almost lost me. Honestly, okay. if, if, if I had gotten that book um, the way I did, and I didn't have someone uh, of say Dr. Ribby's scientific, um, uh, you know, renown and also his, his just authentic Christianity. I, you know, I might've walked away, uh, because it just, it was just totally unreasonable to me what was being said in this book and being said was necessary for a faith in, in Christ. So, uh, so I, I kind of feel like I, you know, I could have, could have been one of those those casualties, if you will, um, and so I think that that um, it fortunately where I am, the students can ask those questions in a in a very nurturing environment where they can talk to theologians and they can talk to science professors, uh, even sociologists, because there's a lot of sociology in this whole this whole thing. Uh, but for students who don't have that 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 kind of um, environment, it it might result, and apparently does uh, often result in in uh, kind of a, a spiritual casualty. 
So that brings us back to some of the books that you've written. And this is like a beautiful coffee, coffee table style book with lots yes. of pretty pictures. Uh, what was your contribution yes. to this book? Well, there uh, are several sections in the book. And my section is, is basically looking at uh, sedimentary rocks and trying to use the Grand Canyon as a means of teaching basic geology. Um, and so, you know, we basically talk about, you know, basic, basic principles of how to interpret rocks and um, going to specific examples in the Grand Canyon that, that illustrate uh, those things about how sedimentary rocks are deposited, gaps in the sedimentary rock record, you know, things, things like that. And then other authors talked about radiometric dating and fossils. I even did a chapter in the beginning where I, I talk a little bit about the history and the origins of, of modern um, young earth creationism, 20th century young earth creationism. Okay. Well, I mean, I've heard people yeah. point to Mount St. Helens and the rapid change in the area resulting mm -hmm. from its eruption. Um, is this good evidence that other formations like the Grand Canyon could also form rapidly? Well, it, 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 it's pretty clear that um, Mount St. Helens and the Grand Canyon are like the big examples that young earth creationists use. I have been to the museum uh, in Kentucky. I have been to the Ark. Um, and it's all about Mount St. Helens and the Grand Canyon. You'd think that's the only place you can study geology. Uh, there's very little about the Appalachian Mountains or any other other mountain belts on Earth or any of the other places on on Earth. So you you kind of think that that's that's all you need to understand geology. And and it is magnificent. We get to see incredible catastrophic geology with a uh, an explosion of a mountain like St. Helens, and we get to see some really interesting geology in the uh, in the in the Grand Canyon. Um, but the the um, the claim that the Grand Canyon illustrates the uh, processes of rock formation that we see in the Grand Canyon just is is not valid. They they couldn't be more different in the, in the kinds of things. Uh, that we see in the Grand Canyon, the, so many things that indicate how the rocks formed, like mud cracks and um, cross bedding and, um, you know, um, raindrop impressions and animal prints and, and all kinds of, of things that, that could only happen near uh, the surface of the earth. That, that is in the shallow um, marine environment or in a tidal flat or in a river deposit or something like that. So um, the, 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 the deposits are just vastly different in nature and in scale. Um, so I know that there are a lot of areas of science where our understanding um, is based on small amounts of data. Like I think right now during the pandemic, we're still gathering data and we don't know, I mean, we know more than we did six months ago for sure. Um, right. But conclusions are still fairly provisional. So when we talk about the age of the earth and geological formations, um, how firm is that data? Is that something that's still provisional or is that something that we, we can say with certainty? I think we're beyond provisional when it comes to the age of the universe and the earth. Um, we will play with the numbers a little bit, um, you know, but just to, you know, a very small degree. Um, we, we have lines of evidence now from cosmology, astronomy, from geology, uh, but also even in biology, looking at, you know, genome and things like that, that, that and all of these lines of evidence uh, point to, in the same direction, uh, the, the antiquity of creation and, and the length of, of creation. Um, so I, I don't see uh, a paradigm shift there. You know, paradigms are... Um, big change, you know, paradigms are what we, we tend to agree by consensus are, you know, the, the best approximation of what what's going on. And um, paradigm shifts can occur 
Um, but I, but I really don't see um, the the fact that so many disciplines in the sciences come up with the same uh, explanation or the, the the same numbers that I, I just don't see us us going back. Um, that might sound arrogant, uh, but I I. I I feel that the uh, uh, the scientific consensus is very, very strong on it. So, just give us a couple little examples. How do how do you measure how old a rock is or a formation? How do you determine if it was laid down by a giant flood or by some other method? Just give us a couple sure. little examples. Sure. Um, Boy, I just lectured on this in our introductory geology class this week. Uh, well, I'm a, a, a geologist who looks at sedimentary rocks. Um, I've done some work with radiocarbon dating, but um, I don't go into the lab and figure out how old a, a mineral is or a rock is. One of my colleagues does, and uh, it's, it's incredible, uh, the, the work. Um, and the number of dates that we have from uh, ancient rocks, not only on Earth, but the moon, meteorites, and now even uh, even Mars and asteroids soon. But um, the, 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 you know, of course, radiometric dating is, is a, a method that allows us to get a number that's, that's fairly absolute. We, we use the term absolute dating, but there's still error bars in that, in that absolute date. Uh, and, and so this is by looking at the ratio of, of um, uh, different kinds of isotopes that are in the rock, starting with a, uh, the number of, of atoms that will radioactive decay into some other product, and looking at those ratios and knowing the half-life or the decay constant, back calculating um, the number of years that it would take for the proportion that you see in the rock. So that's a, a method that is um, well developed, really well developed, and we can get the same age from multiple methods. So that proves that the decay constants haven't changed over time. Many of the objections that you hear from critics of radiometric dating. So um, and then just the problems if the if the radiometric dates were um, somehow uh, wrong because the decay rates had changed. In order to explain a young rock, maybe thousands of years old, with the kind of isotopic ratios which would indicate hundreds of millions or maybe billions of years old, that means that a lot of heat was generated along with that radioactive decay very quickly, in a very short period of time. And that is just too much heat for the world. The world would just be much hotter place than it is today. So that's a, those are some of the reasons why those are, are good, good methods. Doctor, is there anything in geology or environmental science anywhere that would lead one to conclude that we live in a young earth? Or is, is that conclusion pretty much solely a presupposition based on somebody's interpretation of Genesis? Well, at this point, I, I believe that is. Um, the, the geologists that or the, the early natural historians, the people that were really starting to do geology in the late 18th century into the 19th century, they started with a young earth presupposition. And it was informed by the Bible. Um, you know, people talk about Bishop Usher, how he calculated a world that was 6,000 years old. And we think, oh, that's silly. Yeah, that was back in, in his day. Well, Newton did the same thing. And we don't, you know, we don't um, make fun of Sir Isaac Newton. That's just what people thought at that, at that time. And so as they entered into, um, you know, actually looking at rocks in the field and, and, uh, taking measurements and observations and, and trying to interpret those in a very reasonable way, um, the simplest way possible, the conclusion you get to is that, that, that these things were happening over vast periods of, of geologic time. So, you know, I, I, I would say the science of geology started with the presupposition of a young Earth, but moved away from it 
and it and it was pretty much largely abandoned by the uh, late 19th century but it wasn't really intro reintroduced and it wasn't reintroduced from the scientific community it was reintroduced from uh, essentially a few denominations in um, uh, Protestantism in North America in the in the early to middle 20th century so it, it was reintroduced with a uh, a strong religious presupposition. So you're saying that um, the earth is millions and billions of years old, but doesn't millions and billions of years and the extinction of like 90% of all species uh, give credence to the atheists arguments that man isn't special and God's creation isn't really very good? Well, I, I thought about that question because you'd, you'd sent me that question and um, I would look at it another way. I would say uh, if God used 13 billion years from the time of the Big Bang to the time that humans first appear, then we must be pretty special because that's a lot of preparation. So I, I would uh, turn it around. I don't, I don't think that, you know, most of the arguments of atheists um, really kind of fail even philosophically um, and and certainly um, there is there there are just there, there's really good theology I think that um, uh, allows us to navigate these questions and and um, see that that God is good and his creation is good and that what we that he's given us the ability to um, you know study creation and that that um, that, that, that we can, you know, we can use the mind that he gave us to kind of figure out how he did it. Well, that's a great question that you asked, Christine, but you left a little bit out by making that an atheist remark when it's also the same remark we hear from the young earth creationists. How could it be a good earth? Yeah. You know, right. with all this death and right. cancer yeah. and thorns in the fossil record before thorns right. appear in Genesis. So right. um, how do you answer your fellow Christians? Uh, let's say, for example, yeah. when something like Is Genesis History comes out and it opens mm -hmm. this whole other thing. I mean, both sides argue, and I'm not saying they're equal, doctor, but the young earth creation mm -hmm. side and everyone else um, that happens to be a Christian that accepts the old earth would argue that the stones cry out. Mm -hmm. But the young earth guys are saying those stones are really young. So how, how do you counter their argument that with all yeah. that death preceding right. and, and 90% yeah. as Christine says, 90% of the, you know, species being mm -hmm. extinct by now, how, how does that make sense yeah. uh, in God's well, plan? Does that make God messy? Right. Well, messy is something that uh, I think we're messy. <laughs> I think we're messy. I don't think God is messy. I think God is good. And I think going back to that word good is very important because it's clearly interpreted as perfect and perfect in a very kind of modern way or maybe even a Greek way of perfection. It's not the Old Testament way of good. Um, uh, so what I'm, what I, I think is the, the error is that, that, um, that a good creation can seem to us to be a messy creation. God's history with the people of Israel, his people, his chosen people is messy. Um, there's, you know, there, there's just cycles of, of, uh, you know the, the the nation behaving well toward God and cycles of, of behaving badly toward God and and there are times when God allows the the people to be taken into uh, captivity multiple times and so um, that's messy because people are messy not because because God's messy but the idea that um, you know God could not have God would not uh, allow there to say be predation uh, between animals um, in the food cycle uh, before the fall. Just it's it's extra biblical. It's it's beyond what the Bible actually actually says. And so um, I don't I don't find I I, I know that that's the uh, stumbling block for for most uh, people 
um, and I would call them very thoughtful young earth creationists. It's that whole idea of death and sin before the fall. But I, I just think it comes down to a, a, a different um, understanding of what the Bible teaches. And doctor, this is normally Christine's question. I'm going to steal it this week because I think it fits <laughs> perfectly with what you've just said. And that is, um, you mentioned that you might have fallen away from the faith, deconverted, uh, because of what you went through when you, when, when mm -hmm. the evidence was presented to you for, you know, geology and modern science, mm -hmm. but you had that professor, you had that one mm -hmm. mentor that helped you, that shepherded you through uh, and, and helped you navigate those, those dangerous shoals. What would you say to your fellow professors and, and, and how do you approach it when you see the floor fall out from beneath a student who's a young earth creationist and, and thinks that they have to choose between yeah. everything that's been dear to them growing up and the clear evidence and, as you said, the consensus of not just geology, but biology yeah. and paleontology and archaeology and embryology and plate tectonics, mm -hmm. and we could go on and on, sociology. How, how would you advise your fellow professors or, or even yourself when that kid's mm -hmm. eyes yeah. <laughs> grow wide and looks at you for help? Yeah, um, I'm really blessed to know a lot of Christian professors in academia and both public schools and, and private non-Christian schools um, and, and certainly uh, Christian schools. Uh, the American Scientific Affiliation is an organization of, of uh, scientists, Christians in the sciences, engineering, you know, STEM. And um, it's, it's, it's really wonderful that, um, that there are so many Christians actually in the sciences. When you, when you look at, uh, organizations on campuses like InterVarsity and Crew and Navigators, um, I, I understand, and it was my experience that uh, most of the faculty advisors came from the engineering and the sciences. Um, so there, there's plenty when it comes to this issue. Um, students have have uh, plenty of resources, even in a you know, say a big state university, um, for mentoring and conversations. And there are a lot of uh, resources that are available now on the internet. Like I said, 15 years ago, uh, maybe you know, 20 years ago before Hugh Ross started writing about this, you only got one view. You go into a Christian bookstore, you only got one view. Um, and, and so now there, there, are many more, there are many more resources and there are absolutely amazing um, Christian theologians like N.T. Wright and Alistair McGrath and, 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 and John Walton and people like that who, who are writing from either perspective of theology or biblical studies that uh, can provide uh, students uh, reassurance that, that faith is real, that God is real, and that the Bible is, is his, his word to us. Uh, and that um, it, we can pursue science. Uh, God wants us to pursue science. God wants Christians in the sciences. And that this issue of, of young versus old earth or choosing science versus faith or evolution versus creation, these are, are really false uh, dichotomies that uh, a sort of dualism that shouldn't exist and um, that, that they can be encouraged. I know I'm so thankful for these resources. Um, they've been mm -hmm. a, really a blessing in my life. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know of resources when I was growing up and pursuing a science career. Uh, so I'm really thankful for, for everybody who's contributing in this area. Thank you. As am I, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, um, some people aren't aware of these resources. And uh, why don't you give us a little plug on your your giant book, uh, Understanding Scientific Theories of Origins? What's, oh, what's yes. the target so, audience? Yeah. yeah, what's the book about? What's the target audience? Uh, is this for a textbook? About, yeah, it is a textbook. For going on 25 years, we've had a class at Wheaton College called uh, Theories of Origins. And there just isn't a book. That, that does this. And so the students were reading a lot of uh, 
you know, um, various sources, and we, we tried lots of books that would address maybe one or two issues. Um, we had the opportunity in uh, about 2014, I think, to apply to the BioLogos Foundation for a grant. And that allowed us to um, spend the time during the summer and to uh, have funds to purchase rights for, you know, uh, figures and, and things like that to put this book together. And so it, it took us good four and a half, five years. It was a three year grant. So they were very patient to uh, let us get away with not having it done when the when the grant period was over. But but a lot of encouragement. And I know, I know you you know some of the folks over there at BioLogos. Um, they ended up uh, negotiating some kind of a deal with InterVarsity uh, to have books that are kind of with an imprint of uh, InterVarsity or, or uh, yeah, InterVarsity Press and 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 BioLogos, and so this really fit nicely into that um, series of series of books. But InterVarsity had never done anything like this, and you know, I didn't know what the heck it was going to look like because, you know, they'd never done a textbook like this. But I, I have to say they knocked themselves out. Now, the grant allowed us to, to get a lot of the drafting done. All the drafting is original. And um, and their their graphic artists just did a fantastic job. But um, but yeah, it, it, we're, we're very happy with it. So we use it for the course. It's available to, you know, the reading public. You can get it at Amazon, and it's really um, we feel um, fills a, a need for say an, an advanced um, high school course, maybe at a Christian academy or homeschool, um, or uh, I know that it's used at other uh, Christian college campuses uh, around around the country. And it could be used for a course like Theories of Origins, or it could be used for, a, a, say, a capstone seminar in the sciences. Uh, so there are a lot of, a lot of ways. But, but it's written, you know, it is written as a college textbook. But I think anyone who's interested and has already started reading in a lot of the origins literature, uh, either from an old Earth perspective or a young Earth perspective, I think it's, it's accessible. So that's our, you know, that's kind of our target and, and, and that's the, you know, the story behind it. That's great. Yeah. Um, so for people who don't have a book like that, uh, what harm do you see in Christians promoting false scientific ideas with the intent of supporting the truth of Christianity or the realness or trueness of the Bible? Could I quote? Augustine here, and I, you've yes. probably heard this quote. Have you used this oh, quote yeah. on the, the show? Uh, so if you have, maybe I shouldn't, but we, okay. We so yet. St. Augustine, say, this will be the first. Okay. I, I always think of this. Um, I teach a, a first year seminar where we read confessions and, and Augustine had been in a cult before he converted where they had a very um, strange and what he determined wrong view of, of the, the science of the time, which was actually very sophisticated astronomy, but people were kind of using that to justify astrology. So he rejected astrology, but he didn't reject the science of, of uh, the stars and the planets. So he, um, he, he was very down on, on people who sounded like they knew what they were talking about, but they didn't, particularly when they were doing it in the name of the faith. So he said, usually even a non-Christian knows something about the earth, the heavens, and the other elements of this world, about the motion and orbit of the stars, and even their sizes and relative positions, about the predictable eclipses of the sun. And he goes on, he says, about kinds of animals, shrubs, stones, so there's geology and so forth. And this knowledge he holds is to being certain from reason and experience. Now it is a disgraceful and dangerous thing for an infidel to hear a Christian, presumably giving the meaning of Holy Scripture, talking nonsense on these topics. And we should take all means to prevent such an embarrassing situation in which people show up vast ignorance in a Christian and laugh it to scorn. And I, and I could keep, keep going on, but that's just a, a marvelous 
quote from, you know, uh, just within centuries of our Lord, you know, being on earth uh, of, of people, you know, realizing that, that you can do great damage if you are, um, don't really know what you're talking about or if you're, um, you know, using information in a way that's inappropriate and saying that that represents the, the truth of the scripture or some important theological truth. It is a remarkable quote. It's also quite damning <laughs> down through the ages that so many um, er eras or epochs of church history have been on the wrong side of that quote. So um, this is kind of the hard question that I ask, doctor, when it comes to it. And, and that is, if Christians are so wrong about plain things, um, mm -hmm. how can we trust them with the deeper things? In other words, if they're so wrong um, yeah. in so many periods of history about physical, the physical world, how do we trust them for the metaphysical or the natural world? How do we yeah. trust them for the supernatural? So here, here, here we go. The skeptic wants to know, if you mm -hmm. have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the leading of the Holy Spirit and you have the mind of Christ and you have the advantage of, uh, over the natural man of the Word of God and so forth and church history and tradition and confessions and faith. How, how could we be so late to the game when it comes to, for example, what was discovered by Copernicus and Galileo and now Darwin? And why does it seem like Christians are always dragging their feet when it comes to things the rest of the world seems to accept without all the advantages that we have first of all i would say it's not all christians uh just maybe some of the loud ones the louder ones um uh, and some uh denominations or groups might emphasize you know something that is um not part of say the consensus of scientific uh understanding uh but I feel that that if you if you look at the church as a whole, uh, you would find a, actually a different story than what 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 is sort of the perception. Um, so you know, you, like I said, so many of the the, the campus uh, Christian advisors come from the sciences and engineering. Uh, that tells you right there that it's it's not like the the sciences. You you have to not be a believer to. To, to be a scientist. Um, and then in the past with the whole Galileo affair, I mean, it, we were very early in the, the scientific age. There was probably as much politics to play in this as there was, you know, actual science. And, and it really is within a generation of Galileo that you've got Newton and others that are, you know, devout believers, but they're totally working in a, um, you know, a heliocentric solar system uh, context. So I, I just feel that that is over an overstatement of the, the churches, you know, always being behind on things. Yes, um, I wish we I wish that contemporary evangelical culture, particularly in North America, because I guess that's where I live and I know the most about I, I wish that we could be um, more in tune together, you know, unified on these things. So it isn't just uh, origins. It's also, you know, climate science and, and things like that. Um, but I, I think that, that on the whole, you know, if you look at um, the church and all the people that are in the church that, that you would find that we're not as uh, behind on those things and, uh, and, and working to work against it as, um, as, as the perception is. Well, I'm glad you brought up climate science. You're, you're, you're chair, uh -oh. right, of <laughs> geology and environmental science. So, so let me dig deeper on this a little bit, because um, if you look into it, you brought up that uh, during Galileo's time, politics might have played a role. And certainly the evangelical brand, if you will, has taken a hit lately in America, especially over its um, plain footsie with uh, at least one political party. And and that particular party, and I'm not making a political statement, but uh, seems to seems to de deny science when it comes to environmental science or climate science. And and um, 
and kind of kind of preach a defiant spirit toward intellectuals or even uh, people who are experts in their field. We've seen it with COVID, right? We've seen Anthony Fauci and men like Francis Collins being assaulted, really, uh, for for them their expertise and and at least being uh, put forward as under suspicion. <clears throat> Uh, from right. our fellow evangelicals, how 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 does that make you feel as a man who has a deep yeah. faith and also has a respect for science and expertise? Well, yeah, I sure wish it weren't that way. Uh, I m- might not have the 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 sort of insight of a psychologist or a sociologist or a church historian to really you know, really answer that, uh, that question, uh, in a, in a, in a satisfactory way. Um, I just think that, um, some people tend to get a platform and they have a, um, a a platform where they can, you know, make a lot of noise, but, you know, I, I think that in the end, if it is true, all truth is God's truth. And um, people will will realize that they'll come around to the right view. I mean, we're in a situation now where it is getting so hard to deny that humans have uh, uh, an incredible and maybe even intractable impact on the environment. Um, it's just getting harder and harder uh, with the kinds of um, you know fire phenomena and other things that 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 we've seen recently. So. I, I, I think that, you know, people don't want to follow the science on COVID-19. They end up in the hospital, right? Now, people also end up in the hospital that are doing the right thing, and that's a sad fact of a, of a pandemic. But we know that if you take care of yourself and you wear a mask and you wash your hands and you social distance, you have a better chance of, of, of avoiding it. And if you don't do those things, you 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 have a, a much greater chance, and we're seeing that play out in the news this this weekend. So um, I, I I just feel that that over time things will things will turn around for the church. I pray that. Christine, this is my last question. I'm going to let you get back All to right. your list, but um, I, I want to stay in this area since the good professor right. is is playing along. Um, I'm being pulled along by. Yeah. Uh, Professor, prior to Copernicus, it didn't matter to generations after generations of Christians who believed that, you know, um, the earth was the center of the universe, right? It it didn't really play any role in their faith and and, and so forth. Uh, And and you you might say the same thing prior to Darwin. It didn't matter what your position on origins was. The only point in history in which it began to matter— is when the whole world accepted the evidence um, uh, that Copernicus and Galileo and later Kepler developed, except for a corner of the Christian church. And, and then it mattered to our testimony and to our evangelism, because now there was an unnecessary obstacle between maybe the unbeliever and the person we're trying to reach. Mm-hmm. And... On the other end, there was a place where we were stealing glory from God because we we weren't we weren't really realizing that that part of His creation we were lying about part of His creation, in other words, or accepting a lie about part of His creation. So, in our day, when when you see that there's a portion of the church that is um, still behind in areas and and. And now it does affect our witness to others. And now, you know, the atheist can argue against Christianity and point to something that you and I might think is absurd, but our fellow Christian might be making a prominent part of the gospel or pushing it to a tier one issue. I'm interested that you you had advice for fellow professors, but what advice do you have? Um, or how would you approach that student who comes to you who's maybe a little bit more than steeped in that view that really thinks 
That's the Christian view. Is there a way to reason somebody out of a position they haven't reasoned themselves into? And it has become an emotional or a volitional position. What advice would you give for us if we have a loved one who is willing to talk about these things, but doesn't seem to respond to evidence? Yeah, well, you know, we can't control, you know, how other people react to information. And it's not our responsibility to, you know, force them into, you know, our way of thinking. I, I, I want very much, hopefully, for people to think about my work as a, a professor in a Christian school that, that I didn't, you know, try to force or indoctrinate, you know, my beliefs and thinking on, on the students that I just provided them with the tools to work it out for themselves that, um, that there's always humility and respect that's necessary when you're talking about any of these, these issues, um, that, um, I hold my, you know, scientific, even though I'm, I'm very confident in them, they're not, they don't define me. Right. Uh, and, and I, and I believe I could stand it if there was a total paradigm shift and I was completely wrong. And I, I, you know, I pray that I would, you know, be able to accept that. Um, and, and so, you know, just, uh, kind of expressing that, that kind of, um, um, desire for humility and uh, respect for another person's um, views on things will will be helpful to that person, so that they'll 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 you know uh, realize that you this is you know uh, you're valued no matter what you believe about these things, and that there are many things that you one can do to learn more about the issue. I, I don't know if there's that much more you can do than that. So about a year ago, I was uh, attended an apologetics conference in my area, and there were a number of fairly well-known apologetic speakers, and several of them um, made pretty strong anti-evolution claims as part of their presentation. Um, that and they made it clear that they do not accept evolution and that belief in evolution or acceptance of evolution is um, is not maybe not possible with for a Christian, um, or at least not a good idea because evolution in their perspective was false. Um, so since the scientific community so overwhelmingly affirms evolution based on the evidence. Um, what kind of harm is there? What, what, if part of defending Christianity is arguing against the scientific con consensus, is arguing against evolution or an old earth, mm -hmm. um, when, when that's tied to salvation or such a basic mm -hmm. connection to Christianity, what, what kind of harm is caused when people then go off to college and learn the evidence for an old earth or evolution? How, um, and we talked about, about this a little bit, but how, how do we help kids when they're going through this? Yeah. How do we not yeah. do that? Oh, I would, why, would, why would even would someone even argue against that? Well, I, I, I'm very hopeful. I, I see a lot of activity going on now in the church at seminaries, for example, where um, there's an openness uh, for um, seminary faculty and students to learn more about science so that they won't go off and be like Augustine is uh, warning. Uh, they won't be up in the pulpit saying things that are just foolish to anyone who's, you know, has a science background in the, in the congregation. And um, so I, I feel like there, there are more, re like I said before, there are more resources now, now for people. And, y you know, I can't do anything. You can't do anything about that person who gets to a position to be able to go to an apologetics conference or a homeschool conference or, uh, you know, any, any kind of similar thing and, and make those kind of statements and, and, and claims. 
Uh, but it's just like sharing the gospel. I mean, it's, it's almost always a one-on-one -on -one thing. So the opportunity to talk with someone about it with respect and to point out that, that there are different points of view. Um, and, and, and then I, I think the history part of it is, is really useful for people if they, that's why in the, both the, the theories of origins book and even in the, the Grand Canyon book, uh, we try to give some historical perspective. In the Theories of Origins book, we, we always go back to the founders of the science and invariably they're Christians and they're very devout. They wrote books on faith as much as they wrote about their science. And, and, then, and then to show that, that, that this kind of tension is, is really a pretty recent thing and that, that um, that that it's unnecessary. Uh, so I, I guess it's it really comes down um, again. You really can't do anything about that speaker who's earned somehow the right to get up and say what he believes, even if we disagree with them. Um, but one on one, we can we can point people to resources and 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 talk to them about it. And and really, it's it's kind of just like sharing the gospel. It's it, you plant seeds and. It's the best that you can do, I think, probably. So what's your advice for youth leaders, youth pastors, um, parents, homeschool parents, um, for when it comes to talking about science and Christianity? What do you advise? Buy our books. Buy our <laughs> books. No. Um, I, there are, like I said, there are so many resources now. Um, it's just like any kind of news. If you today in this news market, you people tend to go where they hear what they want to hear. And if you're just going to one website for all your information on science, then then perhaps you're not getting the best uh, representation of, of what's going on in, in the real world. So um, my, my advice to, um, to youth leaders is to, um, only talk about things that you really know about, and uh, to if you want to get into some of these questions of origins, to to really look at the the range of, of views that are out there and seek out reputable sources of information. Uh, I've been invited to a lot of churches. My youth pastor at our church, like once a year, I would go in and do the dinosaur talk. You know, uh, so it it's. Um, uh, there, I, I, and like I said, there, there really are now in uh, a lot of seminaries. I know that, that um, um, Trinity Evangelical Theological Seminary has a big program called the Creation Project that is um, providing opportunities for um, uh, Christian scholars, seminary folks, as well as scientists to, to come there and study and work with um, seminary professors and pastors uh, and, and, and really advance a, 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 a comprehensive understanding of the doctrine of creation in a way that isn't just focused on questions about, you know, how many animals could fit on the ark and stuff like that. But it's really about the glory of God, the creator, and, and what we can learn from uh, the great doctrine of creation in, in uh, scripture and through the years theologically. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. So you mentioned a bunch of resources that are available. Do you have any recommended resources for homeschool families for like the elementary school ages? Um, obviously if a family is starting yeah. homeschooling here because of COVID and, and whatever chaos is going on in the school districts, um, they're not going to start with your book, okay? No, of course not. Yeah. The, well, the pictures in the Grand Canyon book are nice, but um, I, I, I think Biologos. Well, I, I'm, I'm not intimately familiar with the material, but I know that Biologos has a, a program uh, that's aimed at homeschool, and um, I think that 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 would be you know a place. I know there were some wonderful high school videos that were made. Um, out of the same grant that, that funded uh, our book, um, where two high school teachers uh, came up with some wonderful videos on, on evolution and faith. Uh, so uh, again, the, the, there's a growing 
you know literature you know that's that's available but it but it's um it's kind of growing slowly uh, so right now probably more information is available online than than say in print mm -hmm. but but i would i would go um uh perhaps to um biologos reasons to believe um you know some of those uh, some of those sites and as someone who was a, a homeschool dad and a big fan of watching my wife homeschool my kids, um, at least up until junior high level, um, I, I slightly disagree with you, Christine. I think you could use the good professor's books because part of a teacher's job is to break down bigger ideas. And I think it would be um, kind of a, a good resource um, to, to mine uh, for for different areas, so um, well certainly yeah. the the parent could read it mm -hmm. and then kind of you know translate it to a level. Um, you know you wouldn't have to explain the isochron plot method for radiometric dating to a fourth grader. Uh, although I've met some that probably could comprehend it, but uh, certainly you, you could you know talk about you know some of the basic principles of of stratigraphy. I mean they're just common sense really. And then, you know, do a field trip in your backyard or, you know, some local state park. And um, I think really my advice is often not to find some Christian textbook on something, but to, to find a good textbook and then uh, maybe find some research sources that, that, that help to kind of answer some of the questions that Christians have about those, about those things. Sure. Okay. Well, that's, that's helpful. Um, I, I know a number of families that started homeschooling this year for the first time. And, um, you know, my heart is just feeling for them if they want to pick some really pretty Christian curriculum that's young earth creation without, um, I mean, maybe they've done their dil due diligence and investigated various positions, but I think a lot of people just haven't thought about it before. They pick curriculum for different reasons. Well, it's true, Christine, and and to be honest with you, Young Earth Creation dominates homeschool curriculum. Oh, yeah, it it sure. truly does, and and you've seen the production values just become much better. I mean, that's one thing AIG does is the production values of their uh, of their material is really high, and that, that's I hate to say this, that's really damaging because it gives it a sense of gravitas or. Um, reality Legit. where it's beyond you know the the clown nose and the big floppy shoes now it's, it gives it a level of respect that it i don't believe it deserves which kind of leads me to um I, I i'm i'm a retired pastor so i can lie once in a while i have one more question for you <laughs> professor and i actually want to get you to respond to something that had great production value and that had a lot of response from our fellow Christians when it came out. And that's the movie is Genesis History. Are you familiar with that movie at all? Okay. Yes, I am. I've there, talked with the yeah. producer and know several of the um, the people who were interviewed. Contributors, yeah. yeah. There, there's one section where um, Del Tackett is interviewing Alan Snelling um, at the Grand Canyon. And I was hoping that maybe we could get a response from you from what they say. Is that is that okay? Sure, Andrew Snelling. Andrew Snelling, yes. Yeah. How we got these cliffs. All right, so you wanted to come here because you see evidence uh, of a young earth uh, because of, of what's here. What, what do you see? Yes, well, the first thing we notice is the extent of these layers. It's like a stack of pancakes. For example, the red unit that goes all the way across mm -hmm. our field of view, that's the Schneebly Hill Formation. And above that, you can see the first white unit is the Coconino Sandstone. And above that, you've got the Weep, and at the horizon, you've got the Kaibab Limestone, which is the, the rim rock of the Grand Canyon. And, you know, here we are, 70 more miles from the Grand Canyon, and these layers are still here. Yeah. It's almost hard to imagine the volume of material that that represents. Yes, take the Coconino Sandstone. We can trace it from here, right across New Mexico, Colorado, 
right over towards Kansas and Oklahoma or even into Texas. We're talking at least 200,000 square miles mm. for this one rock unit that's consistent for mile after mile after mile. That's not the scale that we see today with localised sedimentation. And to get it flat lying like this over such a large area, it's like you have to make your pancake all at once very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And so these layers show evidence of rapid sedimentation, the, the extent of these layers. Uh, was the pancake made all at once? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, one of the things that, that I like to um, you know, teach my students is that um, formations uh, change laterally, um, typically. In fact, at the Grand Canyon, it's not called the Schnedley Hill. There's another name for that, uh, for that unit, the uh, Hermit and Supai group. And so um, the names even change. Some of that's just because you're in a different, different state. But the, the nature of the deposit changes too. And so the, the lateral differences give us more clues about the, the depositional environment. But the, uh, the way that um, conventional geologists explain the widespread nature of the deposits is the recognition that actually the deposits might be getting older or younger in a particular direction. What's happening is that um, deposition is controlled by a number of things. One is sediment supply. That's all he's talking about is sediment supply. Um, and then there's a real volume problem there if you're doing it suddenly. With all, where did all that sediment come from? Uh, the Coconino sandstone is a very mature sandstone. That is that there's, it's pretty much just sand. And so where did all of that weather from? Where did, was there a great storehouse of sand somewhere in the heavens? I, I don't know where it came from other than it was derived from the erosion of pre-existing rock, which takes a lot of time. Uh, but, but getting back to my point is that um, it isn't just sediment supply, but it's also sea level, and it's also the ability of the crust to accommodate the, the thickness of sediment. So as sea level rises across the continent, uh, then, then the deposits go with it. So for example, the Tapit sandstone in the Grand Canyon and the, um, the, 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 the Cambrian lower section of the sedimentary rocks in the Grand Canyon, uh, the rocks have fossils that are older to the west and younger to the east because sea level has risen over um, tens of, well, uh, certainly hundreds of thousands to, to millions of years um, uh, and then, then retreated because at the top of the Cambrian it's a erosional surface and then it rises again and it retreats and so what happens is your beach or your coastal dunes or whatever they move with the, the, the rising sea level and it just spreads out this really long deposit. So, um, you know, I, I, I feel like um, you can stand there and look at a unit and see how thick it is and say, well, it must have been dumped really quickly. But if you look at those rocks, you see evidence of processes that are occurring uh, at or near the Earth's surface. And what I mean by is, is um, on the Earth's surface or in a shallow marine environment, um, and and that it's it you you literally can use modern depositional processes to explain ancient ancient rocks. So a close look at the rocks in their entire context, both above, below, and laterally, make more sense in a uh, in an old Earth framework rather than a flood framework. Doctor, uh, I've heard the other side, fellow Christians, I hate to call them the other side, but the other side in this argument about old young earth and evolution or special creation, I've heard the other side refer to men like you as compromisers, heretics, blinded by the devil even, or only only teaching these things because they want to press impress their secular peers or they want to keep their jobs when when you hear that and then you listen to somebody like andrew snelling talk about the grand canyon in a very narrow interpretation which really only young earth creationists um hold to i know you wouldn't say he's blind but what's what's motivating him beyond his his theological presuppositions there i mean is is the evidence there for what he said 
I don't think there is, and I'm uncomfortable trying to speculate on yeah. what his motivations are. Okay. How 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 do you respond to the heretic compromise? Oh, thing? that okay. well. As some people say it's a badge of honor. I don't I don't know. Uh, I I I've. I don't know. It, it is what it is. Um, I, I feel like I've been called and I've been blessed to be in a position where I can be part of this, this dialogue. And I'm, I'm very honored that I would be asked to be on your, your show, for example. And um, I, I just feel like, you know, when I look back on my life, it's just like I've been prepared to, to be engaged in it and I need to be engaged in it. So it's it's a calling. Well, it's part of my vocational calling to speaking to, be a to part that. Of this um, in regards to heliocentricity, if we can use that maybe as kind of a landmark for what mm -hmm. might be going on now, what might happen with biological evolution and geology and so forth. Um, the church, whether it be Luther or Calvin or even the Pope, right? Protestants and Catholics were reading nature wrong right at the time and they were reading scripture wrong they were taking uh, things literal that weren't right mm -hmm. but it wasn't theologians that convinced them they were wrong it was actually a preponderance of science over many many years and mm -hmm. they you know kind of were left behind like the horse in the buggy so is it going to be the same in our day, will it be a preponderance of science? I, I know you mentioned the genome earlier, and I've talked to a lot of people who didn't come around really until DNA and genetics and looking at the genome of the chimpanzee and the human and mm -hmm. the f fusion of the second, and third chromosome oh, yeah. and, and so forth. Will it be a preponderance of science that drags Christians into the new age? Perhaps. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I guess I, I don't have any control over that. So I, I don't know. I, I feel like we're just called to do what God seems to have prepared us to do. And I, I think that no doctrine of the faith, mm -hmm. no precious doctrine of the faith is going to be affected by the outcome um of this you know debate if you will or this dialogue that that um the the the, the and i've i've heard very conservative um and young earth leaning you know bible scholars um like uh al moeller at uh um south southwest uh yeah so southern baptist seminary say this is a third tier issue you know, I will hire faculty who disagree with me on this issue because it's just not um, so important that it affects, you know, the essential doctrines. So um, I'm confident that that that's that's what's important. Um, so while this is this is this is important in a way, it's it's not as important as as other other matters. And so I'm I'm just, you know, confident that. That, that what's what's really important in the faith will will not be affected by the outcome of this 25 30 years down the road all right so um, tell us about your biggest adventure well, that was a hard one actually to narrow down. I've been so blessed to, as a geologist, you really, you know, you don't stay in one place, you move around. And I chose the three and a half months that I spent in North Sumatra when I was a, a young oil geologist before I was in academia. I worked for a major oil company and uh, I actually took the job with this company because I knew in the first 18 months I'd get an international experience. And so uh, this company had a major gas field in North Sumatra and they were doing more exploration offshore between in the Straits of Malacca between um, 
where Malaysia and, and North Sumatra are. So I got to go over there and help with um, uh, putting together information for a big lease sale that was uh, going to be um, taking place for different oil companies would be uh, bidding, you know, for offshore rights. And in the meantime, they were also doing some exploratory drilling offshore. So I got to be on an offshore oil rig for some time. Uh, I got to travel. I got to know a lot of missionaries who were in Maidan, North Sumatra. And on weekends, we would go exploring. So we climbed uh, two volcanoes. And one of them, Mount Singabung, has, has since, it was dormant when I was there, but it has since uh, erupted many times in the last five years. And uh, so it's been interesting to, to monitor that and to know that I was all the way into the, uh, the crater uh, on that on that volcano at one time. Oh gosh, I, I met so many wonderful people. I even crashed a Muslim wedding one one afternoon. Uh, I mean, I just it was just an absolutely un unbelievable experience. But that's just one of many uh, adventures I've been blessed with. Wow, that sounds really exciting. Were you welcome at the Muslim wedding you crashed? Oh, they, oh, they, they. I was just walking the neighborhood. And yeah. they and they said, "Hey, hey, come, come!" You know, and those things last like three days. Yeah. And uh, wow. so I don't know at what point, but oh my gosh, you know, I was over the top right hospitality, in. right? Over oh, the top hospitality. Unbelievable, yeah. Wonder, yeah. wonderful. And there are also a lot of Christians in Maidan uh, because that that was part of the the area that that uh, had 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 a lot of Dutch missionaries before World War II. And uh, so I went to a really cool English speaking Methodist church there and taught Sunday school. And oh, my gosh, in three months, I packed so much in. I didn't want to come home. 